These are challenging times. The division and frustration are palpable. The balance is constantly shifting. The lines consistently blurred. Truths, half-truths, lies, mixed messages, confusing headlines. All in the middle of a nation whose back has been broken. Hope is drowned out by fear. Peace is muted by chaos. Dreams are crushed by reality. Finding God in the midst of this moment is difficult. As the election draws closer, countless voices will try to sway you one way or the other. Yet your responsibility is simple. Pray earnestly. Seek God passionately. Listen carefully and vote how he leads you. God is sovereign. He always has been. He is faithful. He always will be. And nothing, absolutely nothing happens outside of his providence. This is where we find peace in this moment. Man, what a good message. I want to invite you guys to stand with us. We're gonna we're gonna worship this morning and and I would I would just echo that thought that we just heard. Man, God is in control. And I'm not I'm not scared about Tuesday. Are you? Maybe a little nervous, but I'm not scared because God is in control and we can trust him. He's been a little faithful over the years. So let's just focus on him for this morning and we'll see how the rest of the week plays out. Amen. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be your sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. We are here for you. You are hearts to open. Nothing here is hidden. You are a one design. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Be your anthem, your renown, it fills the sky, oh we are here for you, oh we are here for you, let your word move in power, let what stands, it come to life, yes we are here for you. So open, nothing here is seen. You are a one design. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Yes, you are hot to open, nothing here is seen. You are a one design. Almighty God of love, we welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, 
We welcome in this place. Let every heart adore, every soul away. Almighty God of love, we welcome in this place. Welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, we welcome in this place. hearts are open, nothing here is hidden in you, our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down. You are hearts are open, nothing here is hidden in you, our one desire. my vision, O oh Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that Thou art. Now my best thought, my day for by night, we or sleeping thy presence my life be thou my wisdom and thou my true word I ever
King of heaven, after victories won, may I reach heaven's joy, oh bright heaven's sun, heart of my own Lord, whatever be We, we want that to be what happens today. You in front of us leading, steering our hearts, God, our lives, bringing us into your plan, into what you are doing. God, we are, we are excited. We are honored to be a people that would ever even be looked at by the God of the universe, but that you love us and that you want us to be close to you is, is a treasure. Let us, let us soak in that reality today, God. Let us appreciate that privilege this morning. We love you. We give you our hearts willingly, God, because you are worthy. We ask this, we pray this, we sing this, we believe this in Jesus' name and God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, each and every week we have an opportunity just to remind us to to gather in this space and to, to center our lives around everything that God calls us to. And, and uh, one of the ways that we do that as a church family is we receive an offering just to remember that what we have comes from Him. And so today, if you came prepared to give a gift, there are baskets on the way out the door. If you feel led to drop some uh, gift in those plates on the way out, that'd be wonderful. Also, online, there's opportunities, there's text to giving, there's many ways you can give to support the ministry of the church here, and we're so thankful that God's blessed us with such a great family that's so generous, and so we thank you for that. Uh, guys, I want to just let you guys know uh, a few things are happening. Um, number one, uh, Fall Fling is next Sunday. Uh, yeah. It's exciting. Uh, if you don't know what fall fling is, basically we go out to the field uh, in, in the Borderman's uh, front yard and, and we just hang out. It's, it's a fun fall event where we've got some games set up for the kids. It's, uh, there's going to be a bonfire. There's going to be some food. Uh, but it's a great time for us as a church just to fellowship, just to have a time together out in the field, outdoors, in the outdoor area. There's hay rides at the end of the night. It's a lot of fun. If you guys have never been Come to the Fall Fling. It's going to be a great time for any age. You're going to have something to do. And uh, so that's next Sunday. It starts at, what, 3.30? Is that what it says? 3.30 to 7 o'clock. So uh, bring, bring the family, bring, bring some friends, bring your neighbors, whatever. It'll be fun. Uh, if you're coming, there's a communication card in the bulletin that you can just kind of sign up just to let us know to get a head count for some food. But uh, if not, just show up anyway. It'll be fun. Uh, next thing there, we are still doing our food drive for the Lake West High School. Next Sunday, we are going to send home some grocery bags for you uh, to fill up with a shopping list. When the kids go on, on break for Thanksgiving break, the, the students don't have a lot in their food pantry at home. We want to give them a food box this year just to make sure they have some food for the holiday break that they have. And so uh, next week, come prepared just to kind of grab one of those grocery bags. The following Sunday, you're going to bring it back, fill with as much as you can so that we can have uh, some great food boxes to give to them. Uh, next slide there. Yes, uh, November 22nd is the community kitchen for the Lake Wales Care Center. Uh, we do every other month, the fourth Sunday of the month, and so this month is our month to, to share a meal with them. If you'd like to come help us serve that meal, we just need to know that. Again, on your communication card, uh, in your bulletin, you can sign up and just say, hey, I plan to come, and let us know that so that we can get you on the roster. So lots of good stuff. At this time, though, I'd like to give the stage to, to Pastor Ann. She's got a lesson, or a, a small little devotional thought to give us today for the kids, and uh, then we'll move on. Good morning. All right, let's try it again. Good morning. We had an incredible night last night. You'll hear about that more than later, but... Ooh, more than later. Now or later. That's what I'm talking about this morning. How many, these are more for the adults right now. How many remember now and laters when you were growing up and when they first came out? Yes, this was, guys, this was like our Starburst when we were kids, okay? And they had great flavors like 
Bananalicious and Tickle Me Pink Berry and all of these things. This candy came out in 1962. It's almost 60 years old. When it came out, it was available in three colors. But now it is still around. They don't do a lot of the individual flavors, but they have 12 flavors. But I got to wondering, why in the world was it called Now and Later? Well, this was the cool reason why. Is because when they made this candy, they made sure that each piece of candy was individually wrapped and then they put it together with another piece of candy and then they bunched all of that together in one package and you see it on your tables, okay? Now kids, you don't touch it. I've got yours down at the kids' worship. This is for the adults, okay? And so what it was for was the reason they called it now and later is that so you would have a sweet treat now and you would have a sweet treat later. And so it would always be with you. Now I got to thinking about that, you know, because, you know, what we do in ministry is that we try and show our kids how to make the Bible come alive by using ordinary things. So why not use candy because this is the weekend, okay? And I believe in supporting the local economy, our dentists. So this was called Now and Later. But you know what? Candy disappears. Once you eat it, it's gone. It is gone. So you can eat it now. I can see some of you already enjoying it. But you also have it for later. But then it's gone. And the Bible says in Matthew that Jesus said, I will be with you always. And that was the one thing I'm really wanting our kids to understand. So all you kids be looking at me right now. I want to see your eyeballs. But... Jesus has promised us that he will never, ever, 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 ever what? Leave us. And so it is better than a piece of candy because we can have Jesus now and we can live with him later in heaven. And that is the coolest thing because, and I want you never to forget that, as long as we have Jesus in our life, he is the real sweet treat because we have him now and we have him later. And so never forget that I am with you always, says Jesus. These are candies are for you today on the table, okay? You take them home. And it's just like candy corn, which is my favorite. I want you to think of your favorite candy. Think of your favorite candy and think about what does it mean to think of Jesus with this candy? Make it into your own object lesson, like now and later did. So anyway, I hope you've had a great Jesus is the Real Treat month, and we enjoyed last night. So thanks so much. Have a good one. Well, like Ann said, we had a great time yesterday. I've got a couple slides of, uh, of, of some of the trunks uh, from, from, from last night's event. This was uh, Toy Story. Uh, came in third place for the event. It's kind of hard to see in these graphics, but you can see it on our Facebook. We're so excited for Toy Story there. Yeah, that was a good one right there. My personal favorite, I have no bias here, but there's the Batmobile. Uh, not sure how that didn't, I'm not sure how that didn't win, but it didn't. It didn't. First place goes to uh, the Temple, uh, the Borneman family, and um, the Jungle Temple. Inspired choices on the stonework in the background, Steve. I really enjoyed uh, the stone columns that you used there. Uh, not sure where you got those from, but uh, just good work there. Guys, we had a lot of fun. Um, re really enjoyed just hanging out with the kids in the church last night. Uh, lots of fun. So at this time, though, kids, you don't have to be here anymore. You can get up and go back to Kids Church where Pastor Ann is going to finish that lesson off for you. All right, so hey, uh, as we dive into the Word, if you don't know, I live in a house full of girls. Um, I've, got, I've got some beautiful ladies in my house, beautiful girls with beautiful, strong, healthy voices. Now, now, I know that because they use them often, all the time, and they have a tendency to loudly scream at everything and anything, just all the time. They, they scream. I'll be sitting in the other room just trying to relax, you know, enjoy a little peace and quiet in my, in my new dad chair. And from across the house, ah, 
Like I can't even hit the register. It's so ear shattering. It's, 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 it's so high. There will be this blood curdling scream from one of them. And I race across the house thinking, dear God, someone is kidnapping my daughter. There's an intruder in the house. Dad to the rescue. What is it? Bug on the wall. <laughs> Every time it's a bug on the wall. Like I think I'm going to the rescue. No, it's a bug on the wall. I'm walking to the car the other day. Katie is about to get in. I'm carrying a bunch of stuff. Ah! I nearly drop what's in my hands. I race over to her. There's a lizard. A lizard crossed right in front of her on the ground. Awesome, awesome. I, I'm, I'm making sandwiches, putting the lunches together for, for Katie to go to school. Katie and Becky are by the front door getting all their stuff together. In unison, they both scream. Surely a unison scream is something important. Ah! I race over. It's a cockroach. And that dude started flying, so that's pretty wicked. I mean, that, that, when, when they fly, that's, that, that's no joke. Okay, I get that. I get it. But what gets me, guys, what gets me is it's always the same scream. No matter what the danger level is, it is always exactly the same, okay? Same pitch, same intensity, whether it's a tiny bug that startles them or some wardrobe malfunction in their morning or, or, or someone coming through the window, it's the same scream, exactly the same, always. Like, come on, give me like a high C when your life is in danger. Or, you know, give me some variation like three little yips followed by three wheezes when there's like an, like an SOS or something. Nope. <laughs> nope. It's always the same. And so I say that to tell you guys, parenting is fun. It is. It always keeps you on your toes. Reminds me of a story once of a four-year-old boy who came out of the bathroom screaming to his mother for help. Startled, the mother ran to him asking, what's wrong, sweetheart, what's wrong? The little boy answered, I dropped my toothbrush in the toilet. And the mom looked at him and said, oh baby, that's okay, I can get the toothbrush out, but we're going to have to throw it away because now it's icky. The little boy looked up at her and said, hold on. He races to her bathroom, grabs her toothbrush and says, then you better throw this one away too, mom. It fell in the toilet three days ago. And we laugh, but inside we're saying, ew. Like some of us, you, you, know, you threw up a little bit in your mouth, right? Some of you, you're going to go home and you're going to throw your toothbrush away just to make sure. You know, you just don't know. You cannot be too safe about here. Because you know it would be gross to use a toothbrush that fell into the toilet, right? You know that, right? <laughs> we're, we're on the same. <laughs> you, you know, because you would get a new one. You would. You would go buy a new one. You would replace the old. You would get the new one because that's what you would do. You would make a change. You wouldn't be the same. You wouldn't go back to how it used to be, would you? No, we know that. Something has to change in that moment. You know, there's a story in John's Gospel about a woman who's caught in the act of adultery. And she's dragged to the city streets. She's thrown at the feet of Jesus. And the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they're, they're all gathered around her. They're hurling insults and accusations at her. Threats, condemnation, stones in hand. They're ready to kill her for her immorality. And all eyes are on Jesus in this moment. What's he going to say? What's he going to do with her? And you guys know the story. Like John 8, what does he do? He gets down on the ground and he starts writing in the sand. He starts writing in the sand and the Pharisees, the teachers are like, Teacher, the law of Moses says we kill people like this. We, we, we're supposed to stone her. We're supposed to put her to death. That's what the law says. What are you going to do? And Jesus, he's bending down. He's writing in the dirt. He looks up at this woman. You've got to imagine his eyes, like the eyes of grace, the eyes of love, the eyes of mercy, just pouring from him at this woman. And then he looks up at these angry, snarling men that have surrounded her. And what does he say? He says, whoever is without sin, man, you cast the first stone at her. And one by one, the stones fall to the ground the angry mob just begins to walk away until all that's left is just Jesus and this woman. 
And guys, guys, this, this right here, this is the most powerful moment in the story. It's just the two of them, face to face. And as Jesus is speaking tenderly to this woman, softly to her heart, he speaks with words of grace and truth, grace and truth together. And he says, daughter, has no one condemned you? Neither do I. Go now. And you leave your life of sin. Go now and leave the past behind you. Go and make a change. Go and live differently because of this moment right here. Guys, guys, don't miss it in the story. She was guilty. No one is contesting that. She stood accused and the punishment would have been just. But grace set her free. And you know the story. You've heard the story. The question for us today is, have we lived that story of grace in our lives? Is that story personal to us? Have we seen that change in us? Have you stood before the Lord with your sin-stained and filthy rags knowing that the punishment is deserved? You were guilty. You were. Only to hear Jesus speak softly and tenderly to your heart. My child, I don't condemn you. Your sins have been washed. You have been redeemed, forgiven. And your sins, they are no more. You are forgiven. Guys, that's what grace does. That's the power of the gospel story in our lives. And when the gift of grace takes a hold of us, when that becomes our story, you can't go back to the old way. You can't go back to what you knew. We can't use that toilet water toothbrush any longer. No, it's time for the new one. It's time for you to go pick out a new one because that's what grace does. And that's what Paul's been building to in the book of Ephesians. For three chapters, he's laid out the story of God's grace for us. And in Ephesians chapter 4 that we've been looking at this, this past couple of weeks, Paul says it's time for a change because of what God has done in you. And so look at Ephesians 4 verse 17. Look at what he writes to the Christians there. He says, so I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord. That you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. For they're darkened in their understanding. They're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. And having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they are full of greed. Okay, so some background might help us understand who Paul's talking to here so that we can better understand what he's trying to get across. Now, Paul is talking primarily to Gentile believers in the area surrounding Ephesus. Now, to understand these people, these were not men and women who grew up in the Jewish synagogue. They didn't grow up understanding the law of God. They didn't understand uh, the teachings of Moses necessarily. They, they, they were Gentiles before they came to Christ. All right, these men and women, they, but they, they encountered the grace of God. They're now trying to walk in this new teaching. They're now trying to live their life in a new way, which is vastly different from anything that they knew before. And if you remember, Ephesus was not a backwater town. It was a booming seaport. It was a very uh, wealthy area. In fact, uh, it was proudly referred to as the treasure house of Asia at one time. And the Roman Empire at this time, man, they poured a lot of money into building this area up, into building this city, this community, and the surrounding area up. All right? And so while there was a lot of money funneling into this area, it wasn't a very nice city. It was home to the, to the temple of Artemis. And Artemis, she was the goddess of fertility. Her temple was a huge structure. It could house as many as 24,000 people at any one time. It was one of the, the great seven wonders of the ancient world. All right, but to worship Artemis, she was the goddess of fertility. And so they would, they would burn incense. And they would play the flute music. And, and, and they would create this atmosphere that was designed to arouse the worshiper so that they would engage in all sorts of shameless sexual acts. That was how you worshipped in the temple of Artemis. Now on top of this, Ephesus was a city of criminals. 
It was, it was a place where a lot of criminals seemed to gather because there was a tradition that if you broke the law, yet you made it to the temple of Artemis, you would be granted asylum. You would be granted, uh, you know, um, yeah, you'd be granted asylum from, from your crimes. So the criminals, they couldn't be punished if they made it to Artemis' temple. So where do you think the, Christian, uh, the, the criminals ended up living? Right there around this, this hub of Ephesus. And so Ephesus, extremely popular city, but extremely immoral all at the same time. And right there in the middle of this, you've got these new believers in Jesus trying to live the way Paul's teaching them about the gospel. Trying to live this new way when they've got all of this old surrounding them. It's got to be hard to live a godly life in such a godless culture. It's got to be hard to, to, to trust what the, what the Bible says, what the Scripture teaches, what Jesus would lead us to do when you have all these influences trying to pull you in the other direction. That's what these new believers are, are, are surrounded with. The temptation to do evil things existed on every street corner. And they lived right there in the midst of some pretty nasty stuff. And so Paul says emphatically in verse 17, I insist on this. You've got to do this, guys. You've got to, I insist on it. Don't live like the way you did before. Don't live like the Gentiles. Don't live the life you used to know. Don't use that toothbrush any longer. Because they're, they're, they're thinking it's futile. They're ignorant. Their hearts have become hard. Don't get sucked back in to that old way when you're doing so good as you follow Jesus. Don't get pulled back in. And when Paul says Gentile here in the text, uh, the, the closest thing we can translate that to in our modern day context would be a non-believer. When we read Gentile, really what he's talking about is people that don't believe. People don't believe in the way that God's laid out in Jesus. And what he's saying is that those who aren't in Christ, their thinking has become corrupted. Like they, 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 they don't know how to think straight. In some ways, they're ignorant. They just don't know any better. This is how they were raised. This is all that they knew. It's all that they know. But, but somewhere along the way, Paul makes this connection. He says they surrendered to this thinking. They hardened their hearts. And they pursued sensuality and selfishness and immorality. At some point, they let the floodgate open to sin. And they never look back. In fact, all of a sudden, they think it's good. They think it's moral. They think it's right to live like this. For them, it has become their choice. And, and, and there's a um, behavioral psychologist, Dr. Jonathan Haidt. He's a world-renowned social psychologist. He specializes in moral theory. And he puts simply, he looks at, put simply, he looks at why people believe the things that they do. Why do people believe what they do? And after years of looking at why good people disagree on core moral and political issues... He learned that people typically believe certain things because they first want to believe them. They believe certain things because they first have a desire to believe them. All right, and so in other words, desire precedes belief. Then after believing it, what they do is they find rational reasons to support this belief. But the thing that anchors the belief is not primarily the rational arguments, it's the desire to believe the thing in the first place. And so they have a desire, which leads to a belief, and then they use rational arguments to support why they believe what they do, when it's really anchored to the desire in the first place. And so non-believers, they believe the wrong thing because they want to believe the wrong thing. That's the conclusion. Desire precedes belief. It feels good. It feels right. Surely this isn't bad. I'm going to live like this. I'm going to try and convince myself along the way that it's the right way to do. It's the right thing to do. It's the right way to live. It's the right path to follow. And guys, if that's not a picture of our modern culture, I don't know what is. Because I look at our nation, I look at our culture, I look at everything around us, and I see this, this, this pattern developing. Like we've thrown out the wisdom of God. And we've turned our noses up at the truth. And, and we've run so far in the other direction that I think we barely remember what his moral law teaches. We are corrupted in our thinking so much that we no longer hate or despise sin as a culture, as a whole. 
Instead, what I see is that we celebrate it. We embrace it. We, we excuse it. We pursue it. We, it. we let it consume us. And guys, left unchecked, sin will bring us to ruin. It's what it does. And here's the thing, like we used to know that. As, as a people, as a whole, we used to understand that. We, we used to understand the damage that sin caused. The separation that it brings. The, 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 that sin splashes into every relationship that we have. That, that, it, that it drives a wedge between us and God. And it drives a wedge between us and everyone around us. That's the effect it has on us. We used to know that. Sin, it leads to ruin. And guys, we need to get rid of it. We need to throw it in the garbage. We need to be freaked out when it comes knocking on our door. And you guys remember the story in the Old Testament where Isaiah finds himself standing in the throne room of God? And he looks up and he sees seraphim flying around and they're crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of his glory and his, his, his robe is filling the temple and their voices shake the doorposts and, and smoke is filling the room. And what does Isaiah do in that moment? Ah! He screams. He says in verse 5, Woe is me. I'm ruined. I am ruined. For I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Guys, what if in your life, what if in my life, what if our response to sin was always the same? We let out a scream. We let out a shriek. Get that away from me. Because we know what it does to us. We know how it affects us. What if we screamed and we took off in the other direction whenever temptation came knocking on the door of our hearts because we remember the damage that those choices caused in us? Like, guys, bottom line, it should trouble us to see, uh, to see sin crawling around the walls of our bedroom like bugs everywhere. It should, it should trouble us in how we're living and what we see. It should make us cry out to God because you and I, we live among a people of unclean lips. And if we're not careful, many of us, we just get sucked right back into unclean practices and impure thinking. And that path, it leads to separation. It leads to division. It's all sin knows. But thanks be to God. For He's a God of reconciliation. He's a God of love. He's a God of grace. He's a God of mercy. And God, in that mercy and grace, He doesn't condemn us. He draws near to us. He takes that live coal from the altar. He touches our lips. He takes our guilt away. The good news for us gathered here in this place, the good news for those anywhere that they find themselves, is that in Jesus, by His, by His death on the cross, our sins, they have been atoned for. Our slate has been wiped clean. He has taken our filthy rags and our garments and, and he's, he's wrapped us in garments of righteousness. He gives us new clothes to wear and that's what Paul writes to the Ephesians in verse 20. He says, that however is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul says in Christ, we changed our clothes. For those in Christ, you have a new wardrobe to wear. And we put away the old stuff. We take off the filthy, corrupted layers and we wrap ourselves in His holiness. We throw off the old and we embrace the new. We change our clothes. And so, this past few months, on more than one occasion, there have been moments where I, I have been sweating from head to toe working on projects. 
Well, like, and, and it's like literally profusely sweating to the point that you have to peel the shirt off when you take it off. Whether it was uh, working uh, at the church building painting in, in, in super hot weather without AC or in my garage painting in 90 degree weather. Like brutal days. And there's moments where, where like again it was just stuck to my body this peeling the shirt off because it was sweating so badly. So badly. And let me tell you guys, I can tell you this because I, I trust you. Man, the smell was ripe. It was really bad. Those clothes, I mean, you could literally see the, the stench fumes just kind of rising off the pile in the corner. And, and, and so there were days when, like, I was just saturated in this. And so what would I do? What would anyone do? You'd take the clothes off, you put them in a pile, you jump in the shower, you scrub off all the filth, all the dirt, all the smell, and you make yourself clean, right? Now, now, now any one of us in this situation... It'd be crazy to think that you would step out of the shower, dry yourself off, put a little deodorant, maybe splash a little cologne on, and go right back to the pile of filthy, dirty, stank clothes and put those back on, right? You wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. That would be crazy. Absolutely crazy. And yet we've been bought by the blood of Jesus washed and redeemed and forgiven. And it blows my mind that so many, they'll run right back to the stench of the former life as if it didn't even matter. Guys, you were guilty, surrounded by angry men ready to stone you, and yet grace saved you. Grace intervened. You were ruined. Trembling in the presence of Almighty God, and yet grace touched your lips. You were rescued from the pit of sin. When you couldn't reach Him, God found you, and His grace was for you. Guys, you know the story. You've heard the story. My question for us today is, have you experienced that story of grace in your life? Is it personal to you? Have, have you been brought to life in Jesus because if you have, you got to change how you live. It should affect how you wake up and, and go through your day. It should change how you pursue anything and everything. It changes who you are from the inside out. If Jesus is alive in you, you have to make a change. You can't just go on living like you always have. And Paul writes in verse 30, he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't live your life in a way that's going to bring grief. It's the Spirit in you. And guys, I, I think the church needs to take notice here. I do. Because much of this month, much of this year, in a lot of ways, there's, there's been a lot of conversation back and forth. And much of the political conversation speaks of the soul of our nation. Right? We've heard that. Like, we're fighting for the soul of our nation. Both, both sides of the argument have used that phrase at different points. This is the soul of the nation. And I hear people talking passionately. We're fighting for the soul of our nation. And, and, and as if politicians and, and policies are going to fix our morals and our values. Like, like, do you realize they can't do that? Like, like only Jesus flowing through his church is going to be the change we need to see? Like only Jesus in us coming to life and, and causing us to live differently is going to make any amount of difference in the world around us? We need to put our hope and our faith and our trust in Jesus and allow him to guide our steps and guide what happens next. That's the only way change is going to happen. And do you understand that nearly half of our country doesn't profess belief in Jesus? They don't. And so, so, so why would you think that they're going to support or vote for values that they don't believe in? They're not going to do that. Because they haven't come to life with the knowledge that you and I say we have. It shouldn't surprise us that, that their thought or their thinking is, is darkened in their understanding or that it's futile or that, that it's not God, godly in any way. They don't know any better. They don't know how to act, how to believe, how to, how to walk. And they're looking to the church for answers, and I don't think we've given them a clear perspective some days. 
Because while nearly half the country doesn't really believe in Jesus, those who do say they believe in Jesus, they don't live like it. They don't pursue godly things. They've been consumed by all the immorality they see around us. And I think Paul would speak to the church in America and say, guys, live according to your calling. You were dead. And Jesus brought you to life. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit in this moment. Because the world needs you to stand for what is right. The world needs you to advance the gospel. I believe that when the church of Jesus Christ all across this country stands up for what is godly and says, you know what, we're going to condemn sin. We're going to despise what is evil and cling to what is good. That's when the change is going to come. I don't care what policies they pass. I don't care what laws are passed. I mean, they will have impact on us by, by no means. That's, that's, that's true. You should vote. You should vote according to your values. Who we elect is going to have an influence on, on the, the, the immediate future. But you want to see change in this country? It's going to start by you and me living for Jesus. Because when I talk to my friends and my neighbors and my coworkers and the people around me, I have the best opportunity to influence them with my Christian faith. If I try to legislate that and force someone to, to see it my way, it's not going to work. They need to see Jesus in us. And then you'll see change. When enough Christians stand for what is right, the policies will shift. We want to see change in our nation. It has to start here with us. And Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. More than anything, I want, to, I want to scream at the thought of sin. At the thought of sin wrapping, latching on to my life. I want to scream and run the other direction. I want to hate what's evil. I want to cling to what is good. I want, I want to see the grace that's been given to me. And I want to go and sin no more. I, 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 want, I want to go where grace calls me, where Jesus calls me. Guys, I just, I pray that when, when grace comes to life in our story, that we would respond accordingly. That we would follow without reservation because Jesus, he's worth it. Amen? Let me pray. God, as, as we think about your word today and the high calling you've placed in our life, God, I pray that, if, uh, that you would just draw near to us as your people. That you would remind us of the day you, you stepped into our hearts and, and, and brought us to life. And, and, and that, that feeling, that emotion that, that swept over us to know that you love us, that you care for us, that you, are, that you are good and that you have forgiven us. God, just remind us of those feelings, those, those moments in our hearts. And God, cause us to respond accordingly. Remind us of, of, of the grace given so that it just drives us forward to live for you with every day of our life, with passion, with certainty that we belong to you. God, let our lives be a beacon of hope and life to those around us. God, help us to, to just wrap ourselves in the new that is found in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So guys, as, as we prepare for communion today, as, as, as we process what, what Paul is writing to us in Ephesians, like how do we do that? Because I think none of us in this room want to go back to the old life where, where we were falling apart. We want, we want to embrace the new. We say there's life in Jesus. How do we do that? And thankfully, Paul, he gives us some ideas here in Ephesians 4, the, the rest of the chapter. I just want to read them to us. As you prepare to take the bread and the juice, I just want you to think about these words that Paul would say to us and see what one sticks out to you. Is there any, anything that you need to work on in your story? Is there anything you need to pray through with God? As Paul writes in Ephesians 4 verse 25, he says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. Like, wouldn't that be a crazy thing? That we all of a sudden started to speak the truth to one another? That it wasn't some political message that's been twisted or warped and, and, and that it was just, hey, let me just speak truth to you. I'm not going to speak falsely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to let the truth ring loud in my heart, in my life. It's going gonna, it's gonna to just flow through me. You can trust me when I talk. You can trust me when there's an issue. I'm going to speak truthfully to my neighbor. 
Verse 26, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and don't give the devil a foothold. Because is there anyone in the room right now struggling with angry, anger? Struggling with angry words, angry thoughts. You've got some pent up rage inside of you. Are you giving a foothold to the enemy? By allowing that emotion just to kind of wreck you inside and out. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer. Must work doing something useful with their own hands. That they may have every uh, that they may have something to share with those in need. Is there any part of our life where we're stealing something that doesn't belong to us? Where we covet or we desire and we take from someone because we can. And sometimes we think that it's just grabbing a possession that doesn't belong to us, but. But how often do our words steal something from a person's emotions, from their heart? It doesn't belong to us. Do not let any unwholesome talk come from your mouths, but only what's helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Is there any gossip in you? Unwholesome talk. Are we just talking to talk? But it's not really building anybody up. It's not encouraging. We're just arguing with each other. We're just full of just hateful rhetoric. Are the words that come out of our mouth, do they build people up or do they tear them down? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. With whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind. Guys, let that word echo. Be kind. We need to learn to be kind again. I feel like every conversation is building to a win. Building to a takedown. Or a mic drop. Where I can just say this and walk away and you can't refute it. I'm not trying to build a relationship or a friendship. I just want to win the argument. No, be kind to each other. Be kind. And compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Just in Christ, God forgave you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the penalty for our sins. We were guilty. And yet grace saved us. As we take the bread, which represents his body, as we take the cup, which represents his blood. Let's ask God to strengthen us that we might live right in his sight. Amen. We're going to sing a song of response today to the message. and It's really a song of blessing. Talking about the blessings that God has poured out on his people. Praising God and celebrating the goodness that he's given to us. Guys, if we would just take pause and recognize all that God's given us. And celebrate that life in him. The world would see. That blessing would flow from God through us to them. The change has to start in us. A change in our heart. A change in our mind. Flowing from us the grace of God. 
the Spirit of God living in us, dwelling in us. And so as we sing this song of blessing, today if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, come to the front and talk with me about that decision. For those who have, may this be a a response that says, God, I see the blessing, and I'm going to be a blessing to the world around me. Amen? Let's stand and sing. The Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face on you and give you peace And be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face on you and give you peace. Amen.
So may the Lord bless you and keep you and give you his peace. May he uphold you as you go from this place. May he strengthen you in the days ahead. May you walk in his grace, knowing that his light shines through you to the world around you. And may he be your peace, your shield, your guide as you move with him. Amen. God bless you guys. You have a great week.